Right, Andy McNulty is with us. His new book is called Commit to Lead, Unlock Your True Leadership Potential. Um, you were just looking around the studio there saying it was nice and it struck me, if you were a man who collected memorabilia, you'd have some collection. Do you collect bits and bobs? Do you have bits and bobs? I have lots, but I don't have it, uh, let's say, on a cabinet. I don't have it on walls. I have some of the old jerseys we wore at Queen's. I have some of the old Armagh jerseys. I have my father's blazer of, he went to New York with Armagh way back in 1982 as the coach. I still have the blazer. So it's all tucked away in cupboards or in drawers it's not uh, for show for anybody please God someday I'll show it to my kids What about the um, teams that you've worked with do you have stuff from them down through the years or did you uh, after the World Cup in Japan, interested some of the uh, the guys' boots were thrown on the floor because they wrecked the boots from scrummaging against the All Blacks. Of course, I think it's Tag Furlong boots and Connor Murray's boots. They were thrown in the bin. I said, "Is it okay, guys? I take these because at some stage we give them to charity." So, so some uh, memorabilia yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, with Ireland, they were incredibly good at the merchandise. So you have bags and bags of kit and gear, and again, you give it out for charity and schools or kids with disabilities. It's always a nice way to make them feel special. Yeah. You haven't kept it for sentimental reasons. It's your playing career that you have and your dad's playing career that you've sentimental stuff about. Yeah, it's it's more sentimental. I think the memories are more sentimental than anything else. I'm not big into, you know, the Armagh jersey I wore in O2. You know, and I don't even know where it is, to be honest, but it's the memories for me. It's what it builds in the character. Yeah, OK. There's loads in the book, right? And I want to get to bits of it, but it's your story, I think, is, is really interesting. There's... Um, you were doing a day a week with Leinster. How did that come about? How did you start with Leinster? Uh, Luke Fitzgerald, I'd met him uh, actually in the jacuzzi doing a recovery session after a tough RMA session and I was sitting in the jacuzzi in David Lloyd. A lot of the Leinster uh, guys used to use the same jacuzzi and pool for recovery. They all trained at David Lloyd in the early days in a really old school gym out the back of David Lloyd that is probably the worst gym in Ireland if you look at it in today's circumstance. Uh, and in the jacuzzi was a guy called David Moore who also played a little bit for the Leinster Academy back in the day and for Connacht. I knew Davy and met Davy through his dad. His dad asked me to do some mental toughness coaching with young Davy Moore. Davy Moore was best friends with Luke Fitzgerald. Uh, we had a chat in the jacuzzi about, I guess, all aspects, performance, all ac- aspects, mental toughness. Luke said to me, can we meet in a few weeks? I wouldn't mind talking about that sort of stuff. His dad gave me a call the week later. Uh, a Des Fitzgerald who of course has played for Ireland and he said you know almost to vet me you know who are you what's your background what have you done how yeah. the hell do you know enough to work with my young uh, son uh, so that that went very well look nearly three months after that was brought onto the Irish squad simultaneously Michael Kearney who's now one of the key people in the RFU uh, Michael Kearney was sitting for breakfast with me in David Lloyd and at the next table lo and behold who sat down beside us Michael Checker. Michael Kearney introduced me to Michael Cheka. Cheka was very dismissive, uh, a little bit aloof, not really interested in talking to me. Uh, and he said, you know, again, I could see in his eyes more than his body language, something sparked in him. Had you, uh, like when you were talking to Mick Kearney, were you thinking that maybe you could expand at that stage with, with rugby? Were you, is, so it was Luke your first rugby person ever? No, it was actually Samiri's Rugby Club. Right. Because uh, a guy called Stephen Hennessy is still coaching Samiri's in, in the in the secondary school there. He's the head of director of rugby. Uh, he's a brilliant fellow. He spent his whole life coaching rugby in Samiri's. Uh, and he asked me, they were going to get relegated. He asked me, Andrew, would you do a session with the team? There's a good chance we're going to be relegated. He knew of my work with Armagh, my playing days, and work with some of the semi-pro teams in Ireland in football, Longford Town and so on. Right. And he said, is there any way you give us a dig out? We could be relegated here. And I went to Samiri's that night. I'll never forget it, the longest day I live. And I had a real big flashback on it this weekend because in the change rooms in Samiri's when I walked in, they were post-training. And you can see they were wrecked, they were exhausted. There were a lot of them in the room that were sceptical, a lot of them very resistant, a lot of them totally disinterested. But there was this one fella in the corner and he was sitting in absolutely intensely focused on what I was saying uh, and I remember thinking to myself who's that young guy in the, in the corner and I said to Hennessy afterwards who's that young guy his name is Sexton Right. Sexton hung on to every single word uh, he was intrigued I'm not saying he accepted every single word but you could see he was listening he was open uh, he was curious and he had definitely a growth mindset what age was he back then? he must have been 19 years of age um, uh I, I thought that we were starting at the start, so we have to go back further, right? <laughs> I'm going to Longford Town. Who was Longford Town? Uh, Alan Matthews. Alan Matthews, there we go. Yeah, yeah Alan Matthews, and they won two FAI Cups. 
uh, was was brilliant because again that was all done pro bono because it was trying to like like you guys have done in your early days in radio like way back to 1997 for a juror so cutting my teeth getting experience in semi pro sport and and, mm. and pro sport and Alan Matthews was brilliant to work with because he was working full time in the bank. And then we made a lunchtime. He'd come in with the suit and say, what the hell are we going to do to win this next FAI Cup game? And we'd write a plan for the weekend. There we go. So uh, you're, you're, you're obviously in college in Queens and you're playing football with Armagh. And then I think your first full-time job after college, maybe I'm wrong about this, is as a games promotion officer in Dublin. Is that right? Uh, coach and director of Bally Bonus and Endes. Yeah. Okay. Very lucky, Jer. And that's the start of it. That's Because uh, what you do now is obviously not... Uh, the the physical coaching of teams it's a different type of coaching but is that the like in, in college were you like this is where I'm going to go with this I want to work in sport and coaching and performance I remember sitting in a lecture hall in Queens and John Kramer who was the sports psychology lecturer on our course in undergrad psychology there was 250 undergrads in the psychology lecture hall at the David Cure building and he asked the question he says how many of you in the audience want to work in criminal psychology hands up how many of you want to work in let's say children's psychology hands up how many of you want to work in let's say uh, the psychology behaviour of education and so on all these different things and then he says how many of you want to work in applied psychology out on the ground out on the pitch making a difference in people's lives and applying this brilliant theory in an applied world only one hand went up in the audience it was me right and you and you wanted to spend my whole life coaching people training people advising people having people whether it's in the sporting arena whether it's in the business arena or the performance arts arena I knew my whole life I spent my whole life being passionate about that since probably was 14 years of age that's really interesting and in the book I think um, to go back to uh, to Checker right so uh, it takes a while, but Checker gets back in touch with you, and there's a similar grilling, except probably more intense than Des Fitzgerald gave you. But in the middle of that, he actually brings up you getting sent off in a big game, and like, how do you have the credibility to stand in front of my team when you've had, when you've been sent off? Like, you know, how can you talk about discipline when you were all disciplined yourself? But actually, like, I guess he knows the answer to that because obviously you've got credibility when you say, I, I have been here, I have made this mistake, I have done the thing that you shouldn't do. He'd done his research very well. He, he'd done his research so deep that he went to somebody who played along with me uh, and he found out, what is this guy really like? Has he got the values and the character that we can trust here in, in uh, Leinster Rugby? So he'd done his deep research. All, all those gentlemen, all those ladies in that elite sport, they do deep research on you, your full character. I remember meeting somebody in the Pittsburgh Steelers. We went over there on a study trip and talking to the people that recruited the wide receivers uh, and asking them, what do you do for your recruitment process? And they said, we go to the primary school right. and we found out we go and we uh, interview the person the primary school that taught the kid to see what the true character was like even at that stage so he'd done his research the Steelers literally have the greatest reputation in the NFL for recruiting receivers it's funny everybody who mm. gets recruited ends up making the team whereas it's like a, a lottery pick for the, the Patriots can't do it can, can I, how did you know that at 14 I'm just like when you say I knew that at 14 that I wanted to do that like was this the inculcation of somebody else in you or was it like okay I'm um, at this point in my life where I'm ahead of everyone else mentally that I know I want to I know what I want to do or how how is that I'd say I'm still not ahead of anybody yeah. else Johnny uh, but I'd say I'm very curious and very hungry to learn at 14 years of age my father gave me a book called The Inner Game of Tennis by Timothy Galloway uh, when I read that book from cover to cover and then multiple times I started to think there's not much point in me doing all this running and even at that stage I was playing senior football Kier McGinney in terms of people that inspire you Kier McGinney was a 19 year old and he was the shape of an international rugby player at 19 years of age so at that stage I was training with those senior footballers my dad was the coach of the senior team a few of the guys used to turn up drunk to the matches my dad couldn't trust them I had developed early and he said and you go to corner forward and the, and the big tough senior footballers would look after me but I would still be playing and at that stage my dad used to on the way back from the matches in an old Reynold 18 he played tapes of Lou Tice who'd worked in American football and Lou Tice was talking about positive psychology mental toughness coaching people to be the best version of themselves where the so, hell did he get the Lou Tice tapes in, <laughs> in like 1980s 1990s Armagh yeah probably late 1980s early 1990s uh, where he got it was uh, sent off for them uh, interestingly he, he my dad was a teacher and then because of the peace process in Northern Ireland they were trying to get the peace done uh, and the SDLP, a party led by Seamus Malin, who Features we talked about book, a lot yeah. in the book, 
he sent my father off on a course and said, Joe, we want you to be a development consultant here, figuring out a way to bring the unionist and loyalist community together with the nationalist community to build, let's say, regeneration of rural South Armagh. Will you go on a course before you take this role, Joe? And Joe said, absolutely. My daddy said, absolutely. And one of the courses that he went on was Investment in Excellence, delivered by Lou Tice, who was a guy who worked with, let's say, the best American football players, the best CEOs, the best people in performance arts in the States. Right. That is mad. Like, Seamus Mallon, like, and he was acutely aware from, like, he's from Market Hill, so he's kind of aware of bringing people together. And that sets your dad on the path to kind of... I guess uh, influencing you in the, as a 14 year old For, fortunate John. Yeah. and I think we've all a responsibility to if we're coaching kids if we're communicating to kids like we are today to get children to realise that it's not only about what you do on the hurling pitch or the hockey pitch or the rugby pitch but it's your inner game your inner game is going to be more important in life because it's about life not about how well we do in sport I do find that fascinating like we did chat there a couple of weeks ago about like all the girls that are just going out of sport like from very early age like how do you keep people on the periphery just keep them believing in themselves and know that this is just you're on the, you're on the ladder here like I love the Niall Moyna interview that you gentlemen have done here on Off the Ball I think it's fascinating so I think it's going to be a stretch but yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's incredible uh, so what do I think about that I, I think if we work on people's inner game they're going to be better at dealing with the adversity of life and we speak about that of course a lot in the book in terms of resilience building through resilience uh, I think we've got a real big opportunity of that in early days with kids and their development but even for adults we know that from the US military we can develop their strong resilience or their adversity quotient Can we go back to, to, to Leinster then because it, it, it feels like in retrospect um, Leinster's your big break in, in many ways is that so again uh, you, you're doing a day a week after you pass Cheka's test you're doing a day a week with them contracted and you go to a training session and check it uh, challenges you to like find who are the leaders here who are the people who are doing the things that I need to do and you identify Shane Jennings and then Shane Jennings I, I don't know if it's unprompted or if there's a if Cheka has said listen this guy really rates you you go and have a chat with him or if, if it had been unprompted I don't know what your instinct is about whether or not that was instinctive from, from Jennings but you guys meet and Jennings wants more from you well, well, I'm glad you mentioned Shane Jennings. I think he's one of the unsung heroes in Irish rugby. I think he was one of the cultural architects. So I, I used to go and watch Leinster training sessions. I was contracted one day a week, but to be honest with you, it was a full week of thinking. Because it's a bit like being on earth. It's, it's not what you do on earth, it's what you do offer, your thinking behind it. So I used to go and sit in some of the tra- uh, some of the training sessions at the RDS, and I'd sit away up in the top row of the RDS uh, in a freezing cold winter's day, and you could hear Cheka from the far side of the stand, roaring, encouraging, driving standards Uh, and then I suppose we we really resonated with each other. I met him for a coffee I think in Coffee Society in Ranala and he vigorously challenged me as as Shane always do or always does and in that conversation he was saying to me, you know, what about my own game? How can I improve? Because I can't tell anybody else to improve unless I don't improve. And then lo and behold every time I ever met him including two weeks ago or a few weeks ago I went to one of the Leicester games with Shane Jennings and lo and behold, he's still improving now. He's a CEO of a very successful organisation. So uh, Jennings is the epitome for me of a cultural architect, someone who sets standards, someone who drives the bar up, finds a way to drive it up, even though others around him might resist. He's the fella that in the trenches is always encouraging. Even if he's playing shit himself, he's still encouraging and driving others on. He's a general. When did you go full-time with Leinster? Or did you ever go full-time Never went to full-time. And I'm actually very happy that I didn't, sure. Right. Because I think if you really want to grow, it's about different performance crucibles I never went full time with Leinster or Ireland and I always was appreciative of that flexibility that Ireland and Leinster give me because for the rest of the week then you're sitting down with somebody who's a surgeon on baby's eyes now for me that's a pretty important performance crucible so I, I loved and I still love that eclectic genre of performance crucibles rather than just one the, is is Leinster though important in terms of giving you the credibility to walk into the other rooms? Massive. Not, not that you weren't kind of building that anyway, but... Massive, sure. Uh, really appreciative of that. And they deserve all that credit. I don't deserve any credit for what happened in Leinster, but I can say I've learned a huge amount. You learn a huge amount from watching Johnny Sexton doing a kick in post-training and you're with him for an hour and a half and you're kicking the balls back to him, but... Y- I'll be honest. When you're initially, when you're kicking the balls back, and you're going like, surely I've, I've, you know, got more experience than just kicking the ball back. But then when you watch him intensely focus for an hour and a half in the freezing cold, there's nobody else there on the pitch. You're learning from him, and you're learning. How much of Sexton is not his actual ability? Like for for if he's still the best out half in the world, how 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 has he become this? 
Well, the, the quality of Sexton's practice, he reminds me of Issa Nasiwa over at Lincoln at Bay to Leinster. Issa Nasiwa in his post-practice sessions was just like watching Mozart. It was incredible. The intense focus in his eyes for every high ball, and I'll never forget it, the quality of deliberate practice, jumping, focus, arms, hands, as if he's playing in a huge Heineken Cup final. I'll never forget it. Sex and similarly, Josh van der Flaer, Robbie Henshaw, watching those guys in post-practice, watching them work with Andy Farrell behind the goalposts on tackle tech. It was like watching art form. There's a famous scene that the me lads talk about where they go and visit Sean Boylan in his kitchen and at his kitchen table they take him, they tell him to take his shyness out of his arse pocket and start being the boss. And it's funny how you, you bring up uh, the importance of kitchen tables in the book as well. There's a, there's a summit meeting where um, a, a random cross-section, but completely not random, of the leaders, uh, different age groups and uh, the cultural architects meet in Leinster to decide that enough is enough. We've had enough of the losing, and um, I'm interested now. In retrospect, when you look, you list off the names. It's like Leo Cullen and Brian O'Driscoll and Sean O'Brien and Cheka. So obviously, massive characters. But how do they interact with each other? Because uh, they all have their own individual styles, and they all have their own individual bits of baggage and bits of um, biases. And like, so is it straightforward? Is it is it a straight line, or was there a little bit of naughtiness to work through? No straight lines. I wouldn't wrote this story, by the way, without Jerry Gilroy prompting me about a year ago that Andy, you have to tell the story, so I'm very thankful. Better get a free uh, book now. <laughs> <laughs> so th- that was actually at Czech's kitchen table. Stephanie was in, in the house, uh, Czech's wife, and what happened was... It was in the middle of winter. Things weren't going that well. Uh, we had said that we need to get a real honest, very vigorous team talk. Uh, eight of the leaders were brought together. I think Shawnee, Johnny, uh, Shane Jennings, Shane Horgan, Brian O'Driscoll, Leo Cullen, of course. And it wasn't a nice conversation. It was a robust brutally honest conversation and it was from everything from game plan and Brian O'Driscoll is like uh, let's say an amazing conductor of the orchestra in terms of understanding game plan it, Sexton was at the, at the table and it was about what do we have to do to make sure this team wins and unlocks the true potential like Sexton's a kid at this stage really and, and not guaranteed his place because uh, Felipe is ahead of him but mm. you know I think Felipe might have been he might already have been injured or, n- or not but um, you know it, it, for him even to be there obviously somebody had spotted the fact that that intensity that you were talking about at Mary's was transmissible to the rest of the team as well in terms of okay somebody's coming up he hasn't quite reached the level that we don't know how good he's going to be he's a bit of a late developer but he's definitely worth having in the room when we're deciding the entire future of the season. Everybody used mentality. At that stage, believe it or not, Cheka might have been a third, or sorry, Johnny might have been a third choice, number 10 in Leinster. So first was obviously Felipe, second was Chris Whitaker. Right. And I remember bumping into Johnny one morning uh, on his way to training. Now he lived in the same ap- apartment complex as Johnny, so we were, that was a game of his fortune because you get to meet him regularly during the week, not just on the training pitch, not just in your one on ones. And I remember him saying to me, I'm not picked for the squad for the weekend. So he was a third choice 10 at Leinster. To come back to your question, Johnny, about uh, the talent and the ability of this fella, his men- mentality, I think, has been phenomenal. I, 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 that definitely sets him apart for me because there are probably more naturally gifted players who like achieve 20% of what he did. Like, See, I don't believe in naturally gifted. I believe in it's all about the quality of your practice over a 20-year period. So in this case, 37 now. If you if you start throwing well, the ball... Joe Canning six, then, so is Joe... This is the thing, like, when you watch Lear Kirkgale, you're like, did Joe Canning become the player he did by bashing the ball off the wall from three years of age constantly. With Ollie Canning as a brother. Yeah, or was it natural ability? It's a good, it's a good question, because like, you would say, oh, Joe, it's natural ability, but actually, no, maybe he... Well, he talks in the Laker Gale about breaking a window, and the, there's like a t- hit and freeze and breaking the window again and again and again. But also, he was marking Ollie every day. Mm. He was battering him until he could <laughs> yeah. batter him back. Like, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it is interesting, because we have this notion of like, you know, Evan Ferguson is a natural ability, and he does, but also Evan Ferguson is the son of a professional footballer. Do you know what I mean? And he's been brought along on the right path. Well, it's a hell, it's a hell of a... Uh, there's a neuroscientist, a good friend of mine called Professor Ian Robertson. He talks about the secret ladder. All of the best performers in life have that secret ladder. It's a brother, it's a coach, mm. it's a teacher, it's a sister. Uh, it's somebody when they were a little kid at six years of age started to say to them, use your left hand, not just your right hand. So I think it's that secret ladder that sometimes we forget about. Every one of those Ireland players last weekend have all had a secret ladder. Thankfully now in our sport, we're creating that secret ladder across the board. Um, to go back to the Armagh situation again really fascinating insight into the preparation for the 2003 All-Ireland where you all completely go mad in the build up to the game and go off training and 
battering each other and killing yourselves. And I'm like, ah. Oh. So how do you stand credibly in front of the room and say, you need to rest this week, lads, because you, you, you have the, the track record of it? Made all the mistakes. First up, in that, that 2003 All-Ireland final against thrown, I made almost every mistake you can imagine. One of them was on the Friday night before the game, I went to a beach at, uh, I think it was Julian's Town. Mm. Desi Ryan, my old friend and coach, I spoke to him on uh, Sunday night on the way back down the road from Armagh. And Desi, he's 83 years of age now. It's a lifelong coaching and mentoring relationship. But interestingly, that night in Julian's Town, he took me for a session on the beach to be ready for Canavan. That session lasted two hours. I was exhausted afterwards. So that was exactly what you shouldn't be doing. However, in now working with elite professional athletes, I'm able to say to them, I, I always start even in the one-on-one -on -one still with some of the Irish players, it's, let's talk about your recovery. Let's get the recovery down, first of all, before we talk about anything else. So I think rest and recovery is highly underrated. I remember talking to Lukey way back in the day. I'd say, Lukey, tell me about your, your uh, match day preparation. Oh, I'll get up about 9 o'clock. What will you do then? I'll have breakfast. What will you do then, Lukey? I'll go back to bed. Uh, what will you do then? Oh, I'll maybe read a magazine or a paper or whatever. So what will you do then? I'll have my lunch. What will you do then? I'll go back to bed. So I learned a lot from working with those fellas as well in terms of their recovery protocols. Right. Uh, in retrospect... Um would you think Tyrone were probably doing the same thing though? Was that like the the the, the wisdom hadn't transmitted into GA that it was bigger as best? Uh, I think Tyrone probably were better at relaxing. I think they were probably better at you know enjoying the journey. I think we were probably too intense when I look back. I think we tried too no. hard. <laughs> I presumed you were in the water when you said I went to Julian's Sound. I spent like half an hour putting my legs in the water, not having a two hour session. Like two, you know. two hour session on, and Desi is relentless on the quality of his practice. So it was a two hour session on trying to deal with Canavan's footwork. And looking back, that was absolutely insanity because Peter had wrecked his ankle. He wasn't fit to walk in that final. And the real stupidity wasn't my lack of recovery. He broke, he went on, that's the final he comes on and off, is it? That's the final he comes on and off. And he wasn't, wasn't fit to walk. So yeah. I should have went to Joe and said, Joe, take me off, Peter, because Peter isn't fit to walk here. Put me on O'Neill who was having an unbelievable game that day. Mm. Uh, who would have been the, the person to turn to Geezer and say, listen, we're a bit too intense here. I'm not sure anybody has the... <laughs> I, I would go to Geezer regularly. We, we would regularly sit down and have open, honest chats. Geezer lived in, in Dublin at that stage. In, in 03, like, look, I think we might be overdoing it here. Because you'd all, yeah. you'd all, like, this was the year of the tight, tight That's shirts, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, to be honest, we didn't know it, sure. Right. We didn't know at the time we were overdoing it. No, you'd say that anybody with wisdom in a high-performance environment would have seen that. But to be honest with you, we didn't know it. We thought that this was going to help us go to the next level. Yeah. We overcooked. Uh, what, what was that old phrase that Ronaldo famously had with Neville? He said, you know, be weary of overly watering the plant. Too much water kills the plant. Mm. You water, you water, you water, you water. Eventually the plant's going to die. So when Neville was challenging Ronaldo, but why is not winning every single sprint? Yeah. And, and Neville was trying, to, was trying to win every single sprint, but he seen that Ronaldo was winning three out of ten. In Armagh, we were trying to win 10 out of 10. Mm. There's time to ease off as the horse trainers, and you have, you've interviewed yeah. here the best horse trainers. The best horse trainers know to ease off the horse. I was ridiculously, intensely focused for far too long of my career. Um, and, like, when did the wisdom come from that, from talking to the rugby lads and saying, seeing how they did it? Was that, was that a, a, like, is it literally a penny drops, or is it a slow kind of retrospective, <coughs> actually, you know? Watching Olympic athletes training uh, all over the world, that's when the penny dropped. Uh, David Gillick, I'm, I'm always very thankful you asked about a big break. It was working with David Gillick as well. We had a brilliant relationship. Watching him train in Luckborough University and going along to the session and asking him, is it okay that I train with him? If there was nobody else around other than three or four other athletes, he, he said it's okay and I would stay maybe 30, 40 metres away so it wouldn't embarrass them or vice versa. But I was watching them going, there must be more to it than this. We're doing 20 minutes and going home. So I was going, what the hell, I'm doing three sessions with Armagh that particular day. Me and Geezer will be doing a tackling session at the Phoenix Park. Then we get launched, then we go and do a sprint session on, on the track at Sandry. And then we go to Armagh training that night. And yet I'm watching the professional athletes and they're doing a 20 minute activation with medicine balls. So that's when the penny dropped, but it was too late in my career. Less right. is more. Less yeah. is more. Yeah. I, I, I remember like trying to get into the gym and I was like flat out doing this thing and I basically like I, I didn't ask anyone for advice and then I was just told you're doing like four times as much as you should and I was actually causing so much problem it's like you, you less is more and, and uh, horses are trained exactly for that there's a template for you in the book as well Johnny don't worry yeah well actually I am interested though like the, the skeptics who still like will, will have listened to this this morning they come in skeptical they're even more skeptical now like how do you deal with that we know a particular fellow Ulster man of yours that I'm not going to name um, how do you deal with that well first of all I accept skepticism 
I expect it. You're going to get that. That's life. If you want everybody to agree with you in life, I think Steve Jobs famously said about leaders, if you want everybody to like you as a leader, go and serve ice cream for a living and they're all going to like you. So I don't expect everybody's going to love everything we're saying. What, what I do expect is people to be open-minded. When people are resistant, your job as a communicator, your job as a coach, as a leader is to try and get them to at least be open-minded about an alternative view. One of my mentors in life, uh, he's in a phenomenal leadership mentor. He's Tim O'Connor. He's an ex-conciliary for the Irish government to the US government. And he talks about the concept, when you're having a conversation with somebody, with a leader, you're trying to make sure they don't have an exclamation mark and a full stop at the end of the sentence, that they have a semicolon. In other words, there's an alternative view. Let's meld our views together. Let's respect each other's views. Let's have a real vigorous debate like what we're doing here and if I still don't like it I'm okay with that Johnny I, I respect that I have no qualms with that whatsoever Have you had any conversations with say people from the unionist community even pol politicians in the unionist community saying exactly what you're saying there? Of course, my brother yeah. Justin is an MLA in yeah. the North, in Stormont. Uh, very regularly I've had conversations with people in the unionist community. Some of the people in Ireland camp are from the unionist community. Mm. Some people in Armagh, Ireland camp, are unionist community. So, very respectful. Seamus Mallon, wasn't he the, the epitome of talking about a shared home place? So I would like that we all in Ireland start to think about the future of everybody's welcome, no matter what community they're from. I don't give a damn whether it's the Afro-Caribbean community, the fellow who served me coffee this morning, or whether it's the unionist community in the North. Everybody should make it feel very, very welcome and very much at home. Something, something for slow learners. Like, yeah. um, can we talk about the the World Cup and um, now how you reflect on uh, Japan? Because I, I heard your interview with Luke last week, and it was really interesting just to to get the perspective from this distance. Now, um, you you talked about the learnings, obviously. Uh, I, I'm personally, I felt a little bit like you got thrown under the bus, and I, you know, that's. Um, if you want to talk about that, we can. If you don't, I, I totally understand that too. But what, what, if you were to put your finger on what went wrong and how you would change things now if you could tap yourself on the shoulder, what would you say to yourself now? 18 months before the World Cup, I would have been better at communicating. 18 months before the World Cup, I would have been better at influencing. Because it's not just good enough to say something and send an email and write a pretty comprehensive report. It's only good enough if you influence positive change. So if it was to tap myself on the shoulder now, it would have been Miss Evan Joe used to have deep three hour conversations outside of camp on normally a Wednesday afternoon uh, in a hotel in Ballsbridge. And those three and a half hour conversations were like intellectual tennis or intellectual rugby. I would present an idea, Joe would challenge me on it. I'd present another idea, he'd challenge me on it. Uh, three and a half hours later, we're still there and he's still debating vigorously. By the way, he might only take one idea away and apply it. Or he might take none away and apply it. So if I go back again and tap myself on the shoulder, I'd say, and uh, you're going to have to do a better job at influencing more positive change around three core areas. One, we need to make sure the team is more stress tested under the most incredible pressure. Because my belief is, and I could be well wrong, and there's people with more qualified in rugby than I am, by a hundred X or a thousand X, people like Brian O'Driscoll and co, people like Andy Farr, who's a phenomenal coach, I believe that the scale of difficulty of the World Cup is 10X to Six Nations. And the contrast that we give there is we played Meath in a challenge match in Navan in 1999 uh, and we beat them by something like 15 points. We played them in the semi-final of Ireland that same year and they gave us the mother and father of all lessons. And Sean Boylan ran across that pitch in the middle of that game and he gave instructions in uh, to the guy that was marking, I think it was uh, it was marking somebody like Tommy Dowd uh, and he was giving instructions into his ear. I could hear it real time. And it was like a totally different scale of difficulty than beating them in Navan what was that six months earlier? Yeah, is this is this team stress tested then? This Irish rugby team? I think they're better stress tested now than they ever were before. I think that you've seen in the Six Nations against Scotland what happened when they were really under stress, like the Josh van der Flaer moment, uh, obviously a line out time. I think they've got people around them now who have been in the World Cup cauldron more, like the Paul O'Connells, of course, that understands that, and the Simon Easterbys. I think a big unsung hero was a coach. He's been there now for three World Cup cycles. That's phenomenal. Uh, obviously, Andy Farrell's been stress tested both with Ireland and England as a coach at World Cup time. So I think that's a huge asset. Uh, I also think that Johnny Sexton is much more stress tested now than before. And I, I hope he stays healthy because sometimes your biggest strength can become, it's, it's almost, what do they call it, like a Shakespearean flaw, mm. when your biggest strength can become your biggest weakness. So you were, you were saying there were three three areas. One was the, the stress test that you were, you were talking about. If you were to go back to, to yourself 18 months out, 
I'd say, yes, stress test uh, the team more vigorously, more regularly, uh, one. Two, I would say, is make sure that the bench strength is much deeper and much wider, and I think they've done a much better job this time around. And I would say be unexpected in that, because... I know working with Ian Madigan, who was a phenomenally talented player as well, working with Madigan in the England and Wales World Cup, uh, Johnny got injured, Mads steps in, he had all the game, but Mads would probably say himself that he hadn't done enough work on his mental game to be ready for that Argentina uh, game. So bench strength number two. Number three, I would say, is that the adaptability that Andy Farrell spoke about in the last few weeks, I would have baked that in more regularly in the 18 months before the last World Cup and build that adaptability and adversity quotient. Now, the only way we'll know if that's been done well enough in the last 12 months to 18 months is in another six months. Yeah, and it's um, it's obviously a lot of, like, it'll depend on the results. Uh, in a way, uh, if we get beaten in a quarterfinal and play the best game that we can play but we come up against the France team who it turns out are an all-time great France team then that's fine but if we don't perform that'll be the evidence that it hasn't reached the level that it should do I think they'd be hugely disappointed if they don't get well beyond you know the pool stage in this World Cup because their body of experience their body of work in the last four years has been world class world leading so they've raised the bar on the last let's say World Cup cycle I think they'd be devastated not, not to get beyond the World Cup quarterfinal Are the players quite simply happy under Farrell than Schmidt? I'd say yes. I'd say yes, honestly, Johnny. Uh, now, is that a criticism of Joe? I think all coaches have different strengths. Mm. I think some of Joe's biggest strengths are very complementary to Andy's biggest strengths. So are they happy around camp? Yes, I think Joe would admit that himself. I don't think Joe wanted people to be happy uh, to love every single second of camp. That wasn't his style. That wasn't his leadership style. I think Andy is much more about the family, much more about the environment, much more about, let's say, empowering the players. That's not to say Joe's style was wrong. I, I think that what we need to do, and this go back to leadership, leaders sh should stick to their biggest strengths. Joe's biggest strength wasn't having the family around all the time. It wasn't always about being empowering. He was the best in the world technical, tactical coach, bar none. That's really interesting. Like that, um, that these things can coexist in a way, or that one serves one purpose and one serves another. And it, it seems like uh, the technical, tactical thing Farrell has brought delegated, uh, like well, uh, definitely yeah. that they've they've. So he was obviously very good at defence, right? But he's handed that over to Easterby, and they've also brought Paul O'Connell on board to do a bit of what Schmidt was doing, and so. Um, you would say that there's the the leadership team has grown by virtue of the fact that it's distributed among more people as opposed to I know there's like leadership jargon around command and, and also control. That, and that can't be straightforward at all because you're, there has to be like a structure, but also like a, a delegation responsibility, but also like a trust among each other and no egos really. Or you know, I, I imagine anyway, it's like I think psychological safety. If we go to the research behind great leadership environments, great leadership groups, psychological safety is fundamental. In other words, everybody feels they've got a voice. I think it's a much stronger environment on that now than it was probably four years ago, eight years ago, uh, maybe ten years ago when I started to get involved with Ireland Rugby. I think it's much stronger now. That's not to say that anybody was in the wrong in the past. All organisations evolved, like this organisation. Look at the way Off the Ball's evolved over the last 20 years. It's a phenomenal evolution. So it, it evolves. And by the way, we need different leaders at different stages. So if you look at what's happening in the free world, now we've got uh, obviously Joe Biden as the leader of the free world whereas four years ago we had Trump now please be to God we don't go back to Trump again mm. I think at the moment Andy Farrell's leadership style is the right man in the right place with the right squad with the right leaders there's no doubt about at that at the right time at the right time <laughs> well, I really hope it is the right time because <laughs> uh, that would uh, that would certainly um, be great uh, one last thing Michael Check, obviously uh, good friend of yours somebody you've worked with a lot uh, are you getting uh, are you thinking maybe you might be involved with Argentina at all for coming around the World Cup uh, Check is some character he touched base on me about two weeks ago as he always does and he, he'll touch base when he's got a problem statement and his problem statement believe it or not he won't mind me saying this was uh, and uh, what do you think about X, Y or Z could you come back to me on this give me your thoughts and perspective so then you give him that perspective you mightn't hear him for, for another week and then uh, when you give him that perspective a week later he says yeah that's interesting mate come back to me again another week with it so will I move over to Argentina 
No. And the reason for that is we're expecting our first kid in ah, August. Ah, congratulations. Uh, so that'll be priority that number one. That'll soften your cough. Soft that cough. kid has no chance in life. <laughs> he or she's going to be like, you know, the world leader of two. Yeah, or I was going to say, how do you yeah. not be a tiger parent? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've learned that from my parents. Uh, I've learned that from brilliant people around me. Hopefully I won't be as relentless as a parent uh, as I was as a young footballer, as a young leader. I think we've seen in Castlebar, let them develop themselves as well. Absolutely. I think it, it takes a whole village to raise a child. Hopefully it'll be the village and myself and my wife Julie that raises the child. What but, part of the world? Uh, we're living in Dublin, living in Rathgar. We're living in Rathgar, that's all right, yeah. Got to check out Orwell Road. Uh, <laughs> <the weekend. laughs> a, lot of, a lot of the guys you bump in and they're still on the way around that area of South Dublin. We're very fortunate. But what I would say is, I'd say a big thank you to Off The Ball because you're on with breaks in life. When I did an interview with Jerry Gilroy about 15 years ago, a gentleman listening that day was a global CEO. He called me on the Monday and said, end up have a cup of coffee. And actually, we were talking about Leinster Rugby. Uh, so I'd be always thankful and I would always be appreciative. The power of radio, folks. Oh, well, look, uh, Enda, it's been great. And uh, the book is excellent. Read it. It's called Commit to Lead, Unlock Your True Leadership Potential. And uh, we wish you the very best of luck with it. Thanks a million. Thanks for the opportunity.